esta persona que está aquí sale hoy esta persona so todos, every day. todos los días I come here to to go to United States pudieran accesar a los Estados Unidos they, they all thought there was going to arrive there, there was the possibility that just one moment everything would change and the border would open and they would be able to enter the United States you know he said he was saying it was could be a, it was a bit of a difficult sensitive issue and he said that because they, they probably have people that are watching they know you're here Right now, they know you're here. She didn't realize she was being trafficked. Yeah. The cartel tried to grab her husband. When they got to Reynosa, they said that they had to pay money, and if they didn't pay money, uh, they were going to get uh, turned over to the to the bad guys. They were they were kidnapped for t for ten days. They, they hired a, a peyote uh, to bring them to Mexico. It was quiet, but once once Biden won, a, another wave of people arrived who thought that the border was going to was going to open. Biden promised he was going to take him across the border, right? That's what he promised he did. You're preparing for more people later this summer. You're just going to swim? Yeah, I can swim, right? Okay. okay. This is Matamoros, a Mexican city of half a million people located directly across the border from Brownsville, Texas. This is the scene that greeted us in early June as we crossed over the Rio Grande, cleared Mexican customs, and walked toward town. Dozens of Haitian migrants, a family of Hondurans, a food cart. In Matamoros, the Haitian and Cuban migrants have developed a reputation as hard workers. They're known for taking jobs to earn cash. At the border, cash goes a long way. It can hire a lawyer, which many migrants hope to do. Legal help can often get them into the United States, where they'll wind their way through a series of hearings and court dates that drag on for years, or they'll simply disappear into the shadows. Cash can also hire a smuggler. Every migrant we spoke with on this sunny morning had paid the cartels at some point. Maybe when they first entered Mexico, maybe when they arrived in Matamoros, maybe when they sought to swim across the river. It's a huge cash influx for violent criminals who now control this city a stone's throw from American soil. And our own immigration policies are their fuel. You know about caravan? Caravan, caravan yeah, Everybody yeah. walking, yeah. you took a caravan. He, uh, he, he have to give you a paper. A paper for working. So it basically said it's very dangerous here. You sleep in the street. Kill people here even sleeping in the street. Everyone wants to cross. A lot. Of, everyone has family that already lives in the United States. Pay the rent. You still sleep on the on the street. You know when you sleep on the street, everything can pass. These days, the cartels function as a highly effective de facto border patrol. We don't control the border. They do. Migrants pay them to enter their cities. Pay them for protection. Pay them to clear checkpoints pay them to be released from kidnappings, and pay them to wade into the river and swim for the United States. It's human smuggling on an industrial scale. The cartels assign ID numbers to migrants who have paid and ask for these numbers at checkpoints, bus stops, and at the riverbank. Cartels monitor the Rio Grande so closely, for instance, that we heard of people being plucked from the river if they couldn't produce an ID number, proving they'd paid smugglers to take the plunge. We spoke to a Red Cross worker who met us near the gathering of Haitians. They, they all thought there was going to arrive. There, there was the possibility that at just one moment everything would change and the border would open and they would be able to enter the United States. Van a entrar porque las políticas de Biden 
pues son menos drásticas que las de Trump. People are being told in their home countries that there's, uh, a, with President Biden, he has policies that are not as drastic as, as President Trump, and it's just causing a, a constant flow of people to arrive at the border. Uh, it was quiet, but once, once Biden won, a, another wave of people arrived who thought that the border was going to, was going to open. When we asked him about the cartels, he told us it was a sensitive issue because people were likely watching us. He didn't want to talk about it with an earshot of anyone. You, you know, he, said, he was saying it was, could be a, it was a bit of a difficult, sensitive issue, and he said that's because they, they probably have people that are watching, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, health goodness. Once we were alone, he told us the cartels have infiltrated the Haitian migrant community in Matamoros, and that we needed to be careful about what we said around them. It wasn't the last time we'd hear that. Despite being a small crew of two American journalists and David Agron, a sharp Mexico-based reporter who joined us and helped with translations. What explains why so many Haitians are passing their Monday morning sitting in this particular place? The Haitians, for the most part, have not lived in their home country for years. They've come to the border by way of countries like Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, where many of them have lived for years. Huh? When is the last time you were in Haiti? The ultimate day, Steve, did stuff in Haiti? Uh, uh, it's like five years ago. Five years? Okay. I don't want to go back. And like seven years ago, I lived in Haiti. Okay, and you went to Chile? As yeah, well? Chile. And you've what? been in Chile how long? I went about, I would say, six years. Okay, so you lived for six years in Chile, and only in the past year did you decide to leave Chile and come to Mexico? Yeah. So why did they uproot their lives in these relatively stable places and come to a Mexican border town that's often more dangerous than Haiti, the country they originally fled? The truth is, they'd rather sleep on the street or in overcrowded migrant shelters, scrounging cash and food, paying smugglers, than miss out on the opportunity to get into America and to stay. We're looking for something very special for, for, for living. We got a dream. Okay. The dream for a ride over there. The, the, yeah, the American dream? Yeah, yeah, it is a dream yeah. for, for all Asian people. <laughs> that difference. When we drove to one of two shelters run by Pastor Abraham Barberi, himself a Mexican immigrant to the U.S., who spent the last two years running a makeshift shelter out of his Bible school in Matamoros. At 54 years old, Barberi has been working in Matamoros for more than 20 years and personally knows many current and former members of the cartel here. Some of the kids who once attended his Bible school grew up to be Sicarios. They all know him. It's one of the reasons they don't mess with his shelter or give him trouble. And yet... The cartel controls everything, everything. The government, the police, the military, uh, you name it. They're, they're everywhere. They know you're here oh. right now. They know. Barberi lets us tour his facility. pinpoints the change in migration patterns back to an Obama-era shift in asylum policy. The law for Cubans, remember Cubans used to be able to travel from Cuba to Miami, touch land, and, and, and gain asylum. Well, Obama changed that for whatever reason. Well, uh, that, that, um, that made the Cubans develop a new route. They went from Cuba, and this is because they told me, to Venezuela, from Venezuela, they came all the way to the border. So in 2016, that was the first time we saw the asylum seekers at the border. Never, ever we saw that. And I know because I stopped. I said, what are you doing here? It was cold, it was raining. And they told me, well, we're seeking asylum from Cuba. So we took him some blanket, um, food and stuff, and next day they were gone. Well, Use travel. They had to close down all the all the refugee camps along the border because Biden promised he was going to take him across the border, right? That's what he promised. He did. Barberi says he regularly asks the U.S. government to mount a serious PR campaign aimed at explaining asylum policy in quote plain Spanish, but they don't listen to him. You know, we get together, and I always tell the the U.S. consulate, please. 
make a video in plain Spanish and put it on Facebook explaining the border's policy. Who's going in and who's not going in. And, and they're like, well, they can go to our website. All the information is there. They're not going to go to your website. You need to make a video on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, and, and get someone from Mexico, from Central America, to, to in 30 seconds explain who can go across or who cannot. Because all these people have the belief that they, they can come to the border and they're going to go across the border. And the consulate people are receptive. They want to do that. They're like, well, we have the information on our website. All they have to do is go to the DHS, DHS uh, website or the CBP. They're not going to do that. The migrants might not be convinced anyway. Every day, migrants make it into the U.S., and every day, they're released from federal custody into the interior of the country. Their testimonies travel through WhatsApp and Facebook, convincing others back home there's a path and a chance that thousands are getting in, and they might too. That's all they need daily on social media looking for information for the immigrants. So if they would have a video to go around and say, we're not letting no one in, please stay home. Maybe Joe Biden should say that, or somebody. I know Kamala did it and she got in trouble, but uh, Well, the problem is enough people do get across and then call home. Right, that's the biggest problem. Is that they, they, they get it, their family unit will get across, they'll be held for three days or something, and yeah. they'll get released, and then they call and say, we got in, yeah. we're on our way. Come on, we're seeing the rest yeah. of the family. Most of the migrants we spoke to say they're escaping economic hardship or organized crime and gang violence. They have horrible stories marked by tragedy. They have overcome impossible odds in many cases. But most of them don't legally qualify for asylum under US law. That doesn't deter them. A combination of personal testimonials and disinformation by the cartels is all desperate people need to convince themselves it's worth a shot. One woman we met at Barbaria Shelter, Alba Luz Perdomo, said she fled Honduras with her husband and 13-year-old daughter after a gang killed her brother and threatened to kill them too. But that was just the beginning of her troubles. They were forced to leave a farm where they had been working in the southern Mexican state of Tabasco by locals who told them foreigners weren't welcome. In Monterrey, Perdomo's daughter was nearly abducted by their landlord. They sought help from a man claiming to be a pastor in Matamoros, but who turned out to be a human trafficker and kept the family in his house for 20 days before they managed to escape. They basically think they wanted to, he went to his her daughter and tried to abduct her. So they fled Monterrey. Instead of selling it, we are in Monterrey. And came to Matamoros. We've been in a cup of Matamoros. How, how long ago? He said he go here in Matamoros. Is it Christmas? No, Okay, right here in October. Um, so basically she just said, uh, uh, he, she explained the story how she was with this person in this, in this property and they said get out and she said get out of there because they're, uh, 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 instead of, So she came from Monterey to Matamoros, she didn't realize she was being trafficked. Yeah, but it was there, she said it's not that in, uh, in Monterey, in Monterey. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, basically it was here in Matamoros, they were trafficked, been here 20 days. 20 days? The cartel tried to grab her husband. They tried three times. To here, yeah. in Matamoros. Yeah, I'm asking God to intervene, to do something because it's, it's, it's hard. At the end of our interview, Perdomo asked us to pray with her, and we did. Another migrant we spoke with said he heard Biden would be friendlier than Trump. That Biden was going to give opportunities to immigrants, to immigration, to people that were being persecuted. So, okay, él iba a cambiar las políticas migratorias. At a shelter run by the Catholic Diocese of Matamoros, 
Elias Rodriguez, the director of the facility, told us, quote, everyone who arrives here has paid. Migrants at this facility have similar stories of treacherous journeys north, made possible by forced payoffs to cartels and their cronies in the Mexican government. One man there told us federal agents boarded his bus and asked everyone for their papers. He didn't have any, and the federal agents, sporting guns and badges, told him, you can pay us. So, so the, the policy here with the government. So with, with money, they like it for us. It's, 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 not long after we left Matamoros, the city erupted in violence. The cartel imposed blockades along the city's main roads and set fire to vehicles, supposedly in retaliation for the arrest of a Gulf cartel boss. The city was brought to a standstill. It was a stark reminder of who's really in charge on the south side of the border. We crossed back to Brownsville and drove to McAllen, Texas in the morning walking across the bridge into Reynosa, where the government had recently cleared a large migrant camp located smack in the middle of the city. Workers were still cleaning the grounds when we arrived. We took a taxi to Senda de Vida, a ramshackle migrant shelter that's become, in effect, a walled village, housing about 1,500 people. Children were everywhere, running and playing. The adults loitered under shaded awnings, Hundreds of tents were crammed together in tight quarters, flapping in the wind alongside clothing hung out on lines. Lines and lines of migrants, mostly Haitians, stretched across the dirt road outside the shelter. Hundreds of people, all of them desperate to get in, hot and hungry, looking for some protection from the cartels and the heat. We were told this is a dangerous area, one of the worst parts of the city, near the red light district, a cartel-controlled neighborhood. Why did you come from Tijuana to, to Reynosa? I come here to, to go to the United States. Uh, and uh, did, you, did you think it would be easier to get in from Reynosa than in Tijuana? Más fácil aquí. Más fácil, uh, oh, it's más, más fácil. I think here in the street. Not, not in the shelter. No, the shelter is full. No. Y después salió dijo que estaba todo lleno y todo mundo se sale, se salen. Yo hasta hice un video cuando. That made a video. Everyone's leaving, sleeping in the street. Sí. Thirteen hundred pesos for each person to pay the mafia. This mafia. Y con so, ¿quién es esta mafia? La mafia funciona así, de terminal. Pero quién es? Mexicano, mexicano. Pero quién controla este? Es quién es 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 migración o tiene que ver con la migración o tiene que ver con ese es según ellos porque después que nosotros pagamos 300 migración no revisa más. Okay, so migración solo abre con chofer. So so as soon as we paid this 1,300 pesos, immigration stopped stopped checking us. Sí, así es acá. So he hasn't lived in Haiti since for 12 years. So no, ocho, ha sido ocho años. Sí, eight years. Eight years since yeah since he 
lived in Yeah, so he went to Brazil. Brazil, and then he was in Guatemala, and that's very well, Brazil, ¿qué pasó Brazil? Se, se, se volvió difícil, Brazil became difficult. Difícil, después de la pandemia, todo se puso difícil. And with the pandemic, everything got really tough. La economía, sí. sí. Okay. And this, this shelter is full. Este, este albergue está lleno, ¿no? Sí. Yo, sí. Yo, yo, de mi parte, yo pienso que tal vez porque está lleno y no acepta más personas sí. entrar. Este so yo, so there's another camp. Yeah, there's another on Ultra. Pastor Hector Silva ran Santa de Vida. His time is in high demand. When he ushered us into his small and frenzied office, we watched his staff work to identify people at the shelter who could be bused to the International Bridge, which would make room for more people outside to enter. Haitians make up a majority of residents at this shelter, but many other nationalities are present too. In Silva's office, we met a couple from Russia. They said they were journalists and fled the country after they were threatened by the police for speaking out about the war in Ukraine. Silva said he has had many Russians and Ukrainians come through the shelter since the spring. The Russians, though, had this in common with nearly everyone else at the shelter. None of them knew how they were going to get into the United States. I spoke to a man from Honduras, Hector, who left his home six weeks ago. His wife is already in the U.S., he said, in Texas. Like so many others here, he spent what he had to pay a smuggler to get him this far. And now he has no money for a lawyer. He told me he plans to stay at the shelter for two more weeks. If nothing happens, he's going to swim across the river. My, my, my wife is in the States. Your wife is in the States. Okay, but my, my children, my child, they are a man right now. They're, they're, kidding, they're, they're grown up. Yeah, grown up. They're grown up, okay. If okay. nothing happens in two weeks, I'm going to try to cross the river. To, to, to cross the river? Yeah. And do you, and it, um, to cross the river, do you, uh, will someone take you to the river? No way, no. I don't know nobody. I don't know nothing about that. Just I'm going to cross the river and take my way. You're just going to swim? Yeah, I can swim. I can swim. Okay. Uh, but 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 you're not going to pay anybody? No. no. I don't have any money. No, you don't have any money? No money. Honduras is Honduras. Every time will be the same. New president, last president, every time the same. Silva told us that the busloads of migrants who leave his shelter every day for the United States average about 120 people a day. They are selected by U.S. Customs and Border Protection with the aid of immigration lawyers and nonprofits. He says CBP officials text him daily, sometimes multiple times a day, the names of migrants who qualify for admittance under America's Byzantine immigration laws. Silva finds these people in his shelter tests them for COVID, lines them up in the courtyard with their possessions, loads them onto a yellow school bus, and, at least on the day we were there, drives them to the International Bridge himself. How are these migrants being cleared for entry? Silva doesn't know. No one does, it seems. Even after these people are bused to the bridge, taken into US custody, and released a few days later, their status is unclear. Some of them have permission to work legally in the U.S. while they await their day in immigration court. Some of them don't. There is no discernible rhyme or reason. Some are selected for entry, and some are left behind in Mexico. A second shelter run by Silva, just a short walk away, is also swamped with migrants hoping to get their feet in the door. Back in Texas, we headed to the Catholic Charities Humanitarian Respite Center in McAllen. 
where CBP drops off nearly everyone it discharges from federal custody in this area. It's across the street from a bus station that serves as the migrants' jumping off point to every corner of the United States. The facility is clean, with blackout windows and a Catholic mass in progress when we arrived. Migrants sang along to the hymns and took communion from a pair of Jesuit priests who regularly preside over these services here. There at the respite center, we met Ramon and Victoria, along with their sleepy two-year-old daughter. They fled poverty in Nicaragua. Like many others on the border, the story of their journey north is terrifying. When Ramon and Victoria and their daughter reached Reynosa, their bus was stopped at a cartel checkpoint and they were asked for a code. They hadn't paid and didn't have a code, so the cartel kidnapped them and took them to a stash house with a bunch of other families. They were held there for 10 days until family members back in Nicaragua were able to get together $3,000, a thousand for each of them, and pay the cartel tax. So they said that they had to pay money, and if they didn't pay money, uh, they were going to get uh, turned over to the to the bad guys. Okay. They, asked, and they said they asked us for a code, which we didn't have. Okay. Okay, so they basically said you're going to have to pay. After the third day, they said you're going to have to pay, and if you don't pay, they are going to turn you over to the setas. No water, no... Being no, held in Reynosa. Eh, tiene un bebé. So they said that we paid, and they said, they said because Nicaraguans, they told us Nicaraguans, yes, have to pay. Okay, so, and, and uh, did they, did you come in a boat? Yeah, they crossed in a, they crossed in a, uh, in a balsa, which is a boat. A boat, a boat in, probably inside of a raft. We reviewed their immigration documents, along with documents provided to us by other migrants at the respite center. They were headed to points all across the U.S. where they planned to join family members and friends already living here. Most of them already have jobs lined up, whether they have legal permission to work or not. Some migrants pay closer attention to the news than others. We spoke with migrants and aid workers who cited Biden's policies as a catalyst for the current surge of illegal immigration. Some were following developments in the saga of Title 42. Some had never heard of it. But everyone had heard that people were getting in. It's easy to see how, legally or otherwise. From McAllen, we drove about 10 miles west to Mission, hugging the river until we pulled into a parking lot outside La Lomita Chapel, a tiny white adobe church that dates back to 1899. The interior is modest, peaceful, and stunning. Steps from the chapel, we found a rough trail and hiked toward the Rio Grande through dense brush and swamplands, passing by discarded backpacks and clothing, abandoned by migrants who successfully made the swim, undoubtedly aided by smugglers. After essentially bushwhacking our way to the water, we gazed out on a wide section of the river listening to the sounds of a basketball game at a Mexican park visible on the other side. It's no easy feat, swimming from one shore to another, then fighting through the brush to safety. No wonder a record number of migrants have drowned trying to cross this year. Drowning, though, isn't the only dangerous part of crossing the river. Just ask Osniel, a slender 23-year-old Cuban migrant we met back at Senda de Vida. He didn't give us his last name, but he did tell us he'd paid a coyote $11,000 to leave his home country, transit through Central America and Mexico, and cross the border into the United States twice. So after July 11th of last year, so they started uh, really persecuting, uh, going after all the uh, young people in Cuba. So if, you're, if, you, if they don't let you advance, you're again to get ahead. If you're against them, they'll uh, they'll, they'll they'll beat you. So it's the qué pasó? ¿Le golpeó? No, a ver, 
eh, cuando hubo manifestaciones. When there were protests? Yeah. yeah. Yo salí a la calle, pero a ver. I went out in the street to look, take a look. Solo a ver. Solo to take a look. Y por el, por el simple hecho de estar eh, viendo ahí, yeah. eh, so golpearon, no solo a mí, a muchos más. Just solo for heading out. Uh, to take a look, I got hit, uh, I was beaten, and not only me, it, uh, a lot of other people too. But what we're all doing is we're, you know, we're trying to get money, getting it from, you get it from a family member in the United States, or from your own family, or uh, someone in the United States, or your own family, and then leave the island. So we've tried to enter once already, uh, through, uh, via the river. So all the Cubans. So we all, all the Cubans for the first time went, went uh, tried to cross the river. In a group? In a group. Yeah, in a group because, they, because in Mexico they charge us to cross the river. Yeah, yeah. so you paid? Ustedes pagaron. Yeah, so they, they said it's a, here it's a coyote. They paid a coyote. Okay, and you just crossed? So, okay, so usted contrató uh, coyote in Nicaragua. So he, he hired a, a coyote in Nicaragua. They brought no, no, both, both. So uh, all, all the Cubans. How's uh, usted? How's it? Who said también? They they hired a, a coyote uh, to bring them to Mexico. Uh, usted cuánto pagó? Bueno, a mí me salió bastante barato. For me it was pretty cheap. It was pretty cheap. Porque a mí me ayudaron, pero a mí me salió todo en un salir. I'll save you a dollar. So he paid eleven thousand dollars. Both times he crossed, though, he'd been arrested by Border Patrol and quickly sent back to Mexico under Title 42, the pandemic health order that allows U.S. authorities to expel illegal immigrants quickly with minimal processing. When Osniel left Cuba in early April, Title 42 didn't apply to Cubans, but that changed while he was en route. What happened is he crossed the border on uh, April 29th, and he uh, understood that Title 42, for all of it, all of the time it's been uh, in place, did not apply to Cubans. Cubans would enter, would cross the river, and they would get a, a humanitarian visa. Uh, but at some point in late April, there was a change in policy where the U.S. government uh, and Mexico came to an agreement to, so that a certain number of Cubans, we believe it was 100 Cubans and 20 Nicaraguans, in various points of entry would be returned to Mexico under tw uh, Title 42 provisions. On April 27th, the Biden administration cut a deal with Mexico to begin expelling up to 100 Cubans and 20 Nicaraguans a day from three border facilities. For Osniel, it was just bad timing. He crossed the river on April 29th. He said he wasn't sure what he was going to do now. Having tried to cross the border twice, he couldn't try again without paying the local cartel, and he had no more money. Early the next morning, around 2 a.m., Osniel called David in a panic. He had swam across the river, he said, but hadn't paid and now he feared he was being pursued by cartel gunmen. He said he was hiding on the north bank of the Rio Grande. A GPS pin on WhatsApp showed he was just outside the town of Hidalgo, Texas, not far from the international bridge there. He wanted David to call the police or border patrol to come pick him up before the cartel found him. David got a hold of the local police, but they said it was border patrol's responsibility, and no one picked up the phone at the McAllen border patrol station that night. Osniel's last communication that day, via WhatsApp, was at 5.52 a.m. The GPS pin showed he was on the U.S. side of the border, near the riverbank. We didn't hear from him for 10 days. By then, he was in Brownsville, Texas, trying to raise money for a bus ticket. Over the past year, illegal immigration has reached historic highs. In May, Border Patrol made a record 240,000 arrests along the southwest border, the highest monthly total ever, surpassing the previous record, which was set in April. In June, arrests surpassed 207,000, the most ever recorded for that month. So far in the 2022 fiscal year, 
More than 1.7 million illegal immigrants have been apprehended by federal authorities at the border. With three months remaining in the fiscal year, border arrests are likely to surpass 2.6 million. Nothing like this has ever happened. It is not enough to call this a border crisis. Our southwest border, such as it was, is disappearing. Why are so many coming now? Every migrant we spoke to in Mexico and Texas at some point said they had heard it was a good time to come, that if they could just make it across the river and into the U.S., they would be allowed to stay. And for the vast majority of them, that's exactly what has happened. No wonder they are willing to brave such dangers, pay the cartels, and endure the harrowing journey north. At the end of the road, on the far bank, America lies open to them. All they have to do is get across the river. <laughs>